series of Snack and Learn webinars. My name is Graham Pointer. I'm a geographer and planner from WSP in Australia, and I'm joined by Camden Fitzgerald, who is also a geographer and planner from WSP in Australia, and he's also our regional executive for planning and mobility. We are the lead authors of a recent white paper called Future Ready Curbsides that was commissioned by Uber. Uh, we look forward to exploring it with you this morning or this evening on Tuesday or Monday, wherever you are today around the world, and thank you for joining us. Before we get started, I would just like to take the opportunity to pay our respect and acknowledge all the traditional custodians of this land on which we meet today. For Camden and I, we are on Gadigal land of the Aura Nation. And we honour their ongoing spiritual relationship with their country and continuing connection to culture, community, land, sea and sky. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and the emerging leaders, as well as all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the call. And of course, Australia always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, as we get started, I have two housekeeping matters to raise. Um, the presentation PDF and a PDF of the report will now be available to you in the handout box in the GoToWebinar platform. Also, there's an opportunity in there to add your questions during the presentation into the question box. I encourage you to do that as we go through. Uh, we'll have time for answers in the, at the end. And if we don't get to your question, we'll respond to you directly following the presentation. In terms of agenda, what can you expect for us to cover today? An introduction to the curbside, why we think it's a really important and forgotten piece of infrastructure that's incredibly important for place. Um, exploring some of the tools that we've used in the report to really unpack the curbside. And Camden will lead us on a case study example of that and introduce the design principles that we developed as part of the report and then recommendations for city leaders and opportunity for, for, for some Q&A and continuing the discussion around local places, rural places and curbside. So I would like to take the opportunity to thank Uber for the opportunity for us at WSP to explore this topic. Uh, it's been a really positive collaboration and I'd like to pay my thanks to Ashley Cormack in, in particular for her support. Um, our analysis and report was primarily focused on the Australian and New Zealand context. And that's where the case studies were based too. But we've certainly found through conversations and presentations uh, internationally at conferences like Urbanism Next, that these themes are universal. And something there's something in there for all of us, I think, in our local contexts. Um, the, the structure of the report pretty much mirrors the agenda for today's discussion. In it, you'll find the policy and stakeholder context around the curbside. Um, introducing those tools about unpacking what we're our understanding of the curbside now and into the future, and then design principles and recommendations for city leaders. But let's start at the beginning. Why, why focus on the curbside? One of the reasons was really crystallised for me from a comment by Ethan Kent, the Executive Director of Placemaking X, in a recent podcast. In that, we were discussing the role of curbside, and he talked about reinventing the curb as the opportunity to think about how our system, I think in terms of system, read our transport system, land use system, governance, investment systems, and how that can be reinvented to support destinations and the people, communities, and businesses they support. So the curb becomes this focal point of being able to, to realize your ambitions for all sectors of the, the community and for business. So we believe um, through the report and, and through this discussion, and I hope that, that imparts on you today as well, that we believe that the curbside is so important in terms of how it's managed and allocated, because how you do that greatly influences who can access a place and services um, and what they can do there. It becomes pretty fundamental for the discussion. But just to orient the discussion as well around what we mean by curbside, and yes, for our um, North American uh, viewers, listeners today, we, we spell curb a little bit differently. Um, 
But in it, there's no ready definition out there. So in terms of how we conceptualise it, we think about that, the, the curbside traffic lane or parking lane extending over the curb to, to envelop footpath um, and includes the infrastructure and uses there. And in some places that can be to, to building line as well. And all of that together makes up the place. I think we can all recognise that the curb is a pretty muddled place when it comes to thinking about the, the shared responsibilities of different stakeholders, be they public and private, or with different uses, whether they be for, for access, um, dwelling, or, or other purposes. And this is really borne out when we consider if you get the curb right, or management of the curb, which UN Sustainable Development Goals does it then influence? So the obvious ones are around sustainable cities and communities. So how you access, what modes you prioritise can really have a bearing on sustainability of our cities. And then, of course, good health and wellbeing in terms of those active modes and how you prioritise those by rationing space at the curb. But then you get into the extended um, influence of climate action in terms of more active modes compared to fossil fuel modes, um, industry innovation infrastructure, what you do with that infrastructure, and then really important term um, aspect around access. So how we manage and, and ration that space can have a big impact on gender equality and reducing inequalities when we consider rationing that space. There is a lot going on at the curb. So now in terms of unpacking some of the analysis and, and providing an insight in some of the tools that you can use to consider the curb, I'm gonna hand over to Camden now, who's gonna take us through movement in place framework. Thanks, Graham. Um, yeah, and as Graham mentioned, um, the movement in place framework is, um, well, as, as he mentioned, I'm gonna talk about the movement in place framework and uh, this is something that's increasingly being applied by jurisdictions in the UK, Australia, and New Zealand, and um, I'm sure many other countries around the globe. And it's used to guide planning for more integrated transport systems for different user groups. And a quick synopsis, uh, is that movement in place is a place-based approach to planning and design of transport networks. It acknowledges that streets and the transport network are also places, and it's aimed at guiding decision-making about the built environment holistically, including the social, environmental, and economic context. Place can be considered through three lenses, physical form, activities that occur within them, and their shared meaning to people. Whether trips are within, to and from or through places impacts the relationship between movement and place differently. For example, through trips are often high volumes and speeds and should be separated from places of high activity where possible. And generally movement through the place does not engage with the place but can impact on it, such as express buses passing by. Movement to and from the place interacts with the place and connects it to other places and movement within the place is contained within the local catchment of the place. And these factors of movement can be further considered by travel mode and time of day. Part of movement and place uh, process is to classify the street environments, both for existing state and desired state, to understand where movement and place interact. The figure on the right is based on the New South Wales classification here in Australia. And civic spaces facilitate local access and placemaking activities. They generally have high levels of activity or high significant meaning. They are often key destinations and they have low through movements and movement within often prioritises uh, pedestrians. Local streets have lowest levels of activity uh, but can still be, still have an important uh, local place qualities. And they also have lower movement um, volumes. Main streets are the most complex streets generally. They are the vibrant streets with significant movement functions and significant place attributes. These are the high streets where all the activity occurs. Main roads uh, prioritise high, high volumes of movement and long distance journeys. They are critical for the efficient movement of people and freight. It's important to remember that the classifications can change over time, so daytime versus nighttime or seasonal, and they can change as you move along a corridor. Next slide, thanks. Uh, 
Now, a key part of our white paper was to explore how the curbside operates in the context of this movement and place framework. Previous studies have illustrated how we often dedicate the curbside of our high streets to the least productive uses by prioritising private vehicle parking, which has lower passenger movements than public transport or pick up and drop off zones. We explore this further by looking at it in the context of place and over time and how the function of the curbside and therefore how we measure its performance needs to reflect the temporal change. Building on the previous research, we explore an approach to doing this and then apply that to curbsides in two case studies. I'm going to talk briefly about one of those. So Crown Street in Surrey Hills in Sydney is what we would describe as a place for people or civic space. And we chose this street as we wanted to explore a street with lots of activity where a range of uses come together, making the curbside operations more complex. Crown Street has a high place value with lots of place making activity in the form of cafes, restaurants and speciality stores, which are popular in the evenings and weekends. It's a key entertainment area for inner city Surrey Hills and movement is lower, particularly long distance through movements, although it does perform an important movement function connecting Oxford Street in the north and Cleveland Street in the south. Crown Street is used by multiple modes, including pedestrians, cyclists, buses, and general traffic. So what did we do? Uh, we looked at how Crown Street performed from both a movement and place perspective and reviewed how the curbside was allocated with respect to this. We wanted to form an evidence base to understand how well the curb is working for people and local businesses. In summary, more than 60% of the curbside in this section that we looked at was dedicated to car parking and loading zones during the day. Provision for passenger drop-off is limited with a single bus stop and a single no parking space. Three short-term up to for 15 minute parking spaces are provided and little to no space is provided for place activity, um, although there are some trees and curb build-outs. In the early morning and evenings, this dominance of provision for car parking is increased to, to about three quarters. Loading zones are replaced by longer term four hour parking and there's no additional space for pedestrians or for activity to reflect the nighttime economy. So our key finding out of this was that the curbside currently supports access for a variety of users, although it's dominated by the private vehicle. Curbside allocation does not effectively reflect demand. A private car is only one of the modes that people use to access the, an area, but it dominates the curbside. And so it doesn't necessarily reflect the function and street type that's within the movement and place framework. There's some flexibility in terms of providing longer stay parking during the evenings to reflect changing uses at different times of the day. And there's likely, this is likely aimed at helping to support the nighttime economy, although people traveling by active and public transport modes are likely to generate more revenue for local businesses than those visiting by car. However, there is no flexibility in terms of providing for efficient pickup and drop off from vehicles. Despite being a civic space located in a vibrant and pedestrian dominated precinct, much of the allocation of space on the curbside supports the storage of cars and often for longer extended periods and delivery of goods. There's also almost no provision of space for drop off and pick up by ride share or taxis and the dedication of the curbside for greater pedestrian activity is modest. There are limited opportunities for activities at the curbside, such as outdoor dining, events and recreation, or space for cycling couriers or deliveries to pick up from local cafes and restaurants. Demand for ride sharing is growing, yet there's no designated space to enable pick up and drop off. So there's an opportunity to manage the curb more dynamically, to reflect demand and to reallocate road space from inefficient parking to greater provision for pedestrians and activity. So it's an example of how current methods of managing and prioritising access are failing our cities and not keeping pace with people's changing preferences and the ambitions of the local community and local businesses. Uh, so just as the movement and place framework can be used to identify people's journey and placemaking priorities in different street types today, it can be used to identify which type of new mobility may be relevant for different streets, different types of streets in the future. So the future's not so far-fetched. There has been and will continue to be the emergence of new transport technology. And we can use the movement and place planning framework to make the most of this new mobility to achieve our vision for our curbsides. We took the movement and place framework a little further and added new mobility options. We were able to better understand the customer requirements of these new, these new mobility options for different street types and plan street environments to support them. This considers the uptake of electric, automated and shared vehicles and identifies future curbside features that respond to the streets movement place classification. 
So we then bring this analysis together to propose design ideas or questions for future ready curb sites. Things like identifying opportunities for reallocating right, uh, for reallocating road space where less space for movement is needed. Um, and a greater share of trips taken by ride sharing will lead to a shift away from conventional car parking towards space for pickup and drop off during busier times. This will increase the productivity of the curbside and improve access for people to restaurants, cafes and other businesses. However, provision for pickup and drop off must be balanced to ensure that it does not detract from the most important modes for retail customers, such as walking, cycling and transit. Electric vehicles is another one. Uh, charging infrastructure may be appropriate in certain streets or nearby locations where longer term dwelling is appropriate. And um, deliveries by micro mobility. These are becoming more and more important for businesses and for last mile deliveries. And it creates a greater demand for space on the curbside for dropping off and picking up as well as for charging locations. Uh, it also potentially reduces demand for curbside deliveries by vehicles. So, we developed some photo montages of what this might look like on the ground for Crown Street by around 2050 or earlier. Key design features include slower speed limits to greater reflect the function of the street with lots of people activity and less high speed through movements, narrower traffic lanes, more space for people to relax, some seating and shading and wider footpaths. You can see that on the right and further down on the left as well. And note, we haven't provided charging facilities for vehicles as given it as a civic space where large numbers of people arrive by foot, bicycle, public transport. We don't want to encourage longer stay parking, which this would do. However, we've provided electric charging facilities for bicycles. Uh, there's also potential for less loading space required if e-bikes take up a larger share of last mile deliveries. And uh, we've also provided uh, more greenery in the, in the form of green walls, um, as you can see on the left there down the bottom. Um, to, which should help reduce any urban heat island effects. And the next slide, thanks. Uh, this is, we've also shown an example of flexible curbside management in the form of dynamic space allocation and signage. And uh, this could be tech enabled to support rapid changes in use and uh, changing in real time according to demand. It could enable more pickup and drop off of passengers and less long-term parking. There's opportunity for sharing of zones depending on the best use for a particular time. A dynamic pricing regime that prioritises the most productive uses that support the vision for the place would also be ideal. And of course, access for buses uh, would continue to be provided for. This could be in the form of regular service buses or on-demand services, and these could of course be automated in the future. And back to thanks, you, Karen. Thanks, thanks. Um, and then after doing a lot of that, that deep deep thinking around principles and and then we move to what would it take to implement these these visions of the future but also to realize the benefits now and so we developed 10 actions for today's city leaders whether they're public or private and you can see our list of of 10 there on the screen now and you can see if you start on the left it, it begins in that planning and strategic space and then moving to the right becomes a lot more granular and things that can be done um, quite tactically today. And so I think that's too much to go through right now, but but in terms of highlighting just a couple, I'll, I'll choose a couple and, and Camden will do as well. I think number seven, in terms of moving from general parking to pick up drop off um, for people and for goods, I think in terms of that accentuates the importance of keeping our regulation of the curbside uh, under review to best reflect the, the uses that are around them. So if we think about what is the most productive use of that curb, how do we make it work the hardest for the surrounding community and those businesses? I think more and more we're seeing this story around um, pick up drop off being a really important aspect, whether that's vehicles or uh, for micro mobility. And that's something that we need to consider. I also wanna pick out number 10, about always designing and continually upgrading local infrastructure for safe use. We need a safe systems approach. We need people of all ages and abilities to be able to access um, their local places. And that there's a big infrastructure story as a part of that in terms of how we manage the curbside to enable that access by different modes. But then also when we consider the catchment 
of our places. What does that mean for, for pavements and, and crossing roads easily? Very much borrowing from the healthy streets approach from, from the UK. Over to you, Camden. Thanks, Graham. Uh, a couple that I'll pick out. Uh, number two, and this is about ensuring we don't just prioritise new technology for technology's sake. So a key, a key thing to consider here is that just because we have new technology that might mean certain modes, such as cars, are more environmentally friendly, it does not automatically mean that we need to provide parking for electric vehicles everywhere. So yes, it should be prioritised over standard internal combustion engine vehicles, but not to the point where we're encouraging more people into their private, albeit electrical vehicle, adding to congestion on our roads. And not at the expense of priority for active and public transport. This is why using the movement and place framework is critical as it identifies what the desired function of and personal uh, performance characteristics of the street are, and then we can decide what design elements are appropriate. Another one is number four, and this may seem obvious, however, it's really important to consider that, that we want our what we want our streets to look like and feel like when undertaking road and street network plans. It's not just about what happens from curb to curb or, or about moving people and vehicles through a corridor, but more so what happens from property line to property line. And what are the place attributes now and what are the desired place attributes for, for the street in question? Excellent. Yeah, incredibly important to have that have those network plans, having a well-rounded view to make sure that place is considered as a part of those. Um, in terms of key takeaways that we'd like you to, to go away with today, if nothing else, is, is hopefully we've made the case that a focus on curbside really, really matters for, for people in our places. That it's an incredibly contested space with a variety of uses and stakeholders, but it really is worth it for us all to come together to make sure that we make the most of such an important piece of infrastructure. Um, in all of this, it's a focus on, on people. When, when we talk about new tech, to Camden's point previously, let's not worry about a fear of missing out. Let's, let's focus on people and consider the best enabler to realise our vision for what we want for people and, and our places. And then of course, collaboration is key in such a contested space. It requires communities, businesses and, and government to come together. Um, that rounds off our quick whirlwind um, presentation. Hopefully we've converted you to be curb nerds as well. Um, and now I think it's time for some question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Graham and Camden for a fantastic presentation. Uh, so just a reminder, uh, you can always log your questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar platform and also you can download a PDF version of the presentation along with the full report in the handout box on the dashboard. So we start with the first question. How has COVID-19 changed how we use the curbside and will it have a lasting effect? Who's taking this one, Camden? I'm happy to. <laughs> oh, webcam. Um, oh, so I think it's been a great experiment through um, COVID-19 when we consider the the increase in in use and importance of our local uh, local places and local centres, and we've seen a lot of really interesting examples around um, tactical urbanism and, and the role that that plays to to encourage the productivity of our local spaces. And so I think we've seen through some quite local examples here in Sydney, but then you see them also um, in, in New York and, and other places around the world about the great opportunities that that has provided. And, and I think there's some indication there that those aspects are sticky. And I guess the countervailing fact is the, the increase in, in car use as well, that, that movement function away from transit in some locations. Um, I think there's a lot of concern that that's going to be a sticky behaviour as well. I'm less less concerned about that, I think. I think people will, will snap back to, to public transit use. I don't know if you have a view, Camden. Are you You're on mute, you? Camden. Of course I am. Um, so I'm very hopeful that, yes, people will snap back to um, using public transport again. And I think that will happen, especially once um, vaccinations 
rolled uh, rolled out. But one of the observations is that it's been a lot more use of um, cargo bikes for deliveries for the last mile uh, last mile deliveries, and um, which has seen a lot more activity in our cycle lanes, but also um, needing access to the curbside. Um, and so I think that's one of the key changes, and um, that may be one of those sticking. Uh, behaviours which we need to be cognisant of and, and um, the requirement as Graham was talking about for sort of uh, restaurants and cafes to be having outdoor seating and so forth um, because of COVID um, is actually a, a really great thing that's come out of this and there's been as Graham said some changes with tactical urbanism to create more space for that kind of behaviour um, and, and, and activity um, so yeah, tactical urbanism is a real opportunity here um, to some, t test some of these ideas and, and there's a real catalyst here at the moment to do that type of stuff. I think there, I see a question in the chat around the implications for curbside of, of e-mobility, so e-bikes and e-scooters, and that probably segues from what Camden was mentioning there. And I think at the, I think the essence of what we're, we've been talking about in this presentation and the report is starting with that, that vision for the place and, and what we want to see, what we want to achieve there. So in the case of that, um, that really interesting phenomenon around like your Uber Eats or Menulog, those food delivery services really picking up during lockdown and then staying sticky. And we've got a number of businesses now that rely on that as a part of their, their business models. And that in turn, if that's if that's what we need from the place, how do we best enable that? Um, and so then I think then that prioritisation question comes in. So that that four hour parking spot on Crown Street is that better served for for a car for four hours, or could it be the location that is a pickup drop off for those um, delivery bikes, as an example? Um, and then when we consider the types of behaviours that we want to reinforce and encourage does charging infrastructure then follow that that's a good idea for those spaces as well to encourage e-bikes or e-scooters into those places to, to normalise them um, as much as to provide that function. I don't know if you wanted to expand on that Camden. No, I think you've covered it well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next question, any thoughts on configuration and safety for active transportation like bikes, skates, scooter lanes. Um, the, the comment here is many passenger zones have experience, have designed in conf conflicts. Yeah, that's a challenging one. Um, that, that, and I think the, the key thing to remember here when we're doing this is what the vision is for the place um, and, and what we're um, what behaviours we're wanting to see um, in, in this location and are we wanting high, is it about getting a lot of people through the corridor or is it about um, getting people to the corridor and activity on the on on, on the street so there, there it is uh, one of those challenges of, of getting that balance right and, and um, I would say that in a um, situation like we were talking with the civic space in um, Crown Street, I wouldn't necessarily be saying that is appropriate for say a cycling lane, um, but then that might be on the adjacent corridor, which is much more around moving, uh, which there, where there is a bike lane and then adjacent road. Um, and there's also the challenge of what we, we're doing with, you know, um, scooters and so forth as well. And, you know, we, one of the things we touched on was around, um, a third speed and um, lanes and how how that might operate. Um, so yeah, it's there's there's no obvious uh, easy solution. However, um, it, I'd just say you need to really consider what what the priority should be at that location. I don't know, Graham, if you wanted to add to that. No, no, I think in a safe systems approach, it's it's around what. What is the function of, what's the movement function, what's the place function of that that link, and then tailoring the approach accordingly. Um, and yeah, and, and in some cases that's hard infrastructure in terms of separated cycle lanes, others it's more 
regulatory around speed limits and, and, and the like to create that safe environment. So it does become a horse for courses. Thank you. Uh, we'll take the last question. We have additional questions. However, however we don't have time within uh, the 30 minutes. Uh, so remaining questions will be answered directly by the presenters. Um, the last question is how could dynamic pricing of curb space work? Um, I can have a go at that one. Um, it's it's a um, the mechanics um, it could be quite uh, well um, a tricky, but there's smarter people than myself with uh, that know about uh, that. But there's technology that's there, um, and we need to price according to the vision for the place is the key thing to think uh, to consider then again um, and what, what are the behaviours you want to encourage and there's opportunities like um, having dynamic pricing in the signage, dynamic signage um, and also uh, with the connected vehicles uh, there's opportunity for identifying uh, yeah, for example when you're um, you're going in your car and you, you, you set the parameters around what you want um, in terms of how much you're willing to pay and also how far you're willing to walk from your destination um, and that can um, there can be some uh, messages sent between um, the parking infrastructure and the uh, and the connected automated vehicles and um, and that can sort of help to guide the the car that uh, the, whether it's automated or not, the car, the electric car driver to where the most appropriate place to park is and that can help to reduce any sort of driving around in circles looking for parking. Um, as I say, the, the, I think the technology is there, it's just, and, and there's a lot of data available. Um, we've just got to uh, work out the best way to do that and, how, and, and there's obviously regular um, pricing regimes in place and we need to work through those but I think there's a real opportunity uh, to to price more dynamically um, to to basically make the, the curbside work harder and to um, really sort of get that higher productivity out of the vehicle out of the curbside where appropriate. I don't know Graham did you want to add to that? That's great. Thank you guys. Um, so we're at the end of our webinar session. So please feel free to follow up directly with Graham and Camden via the contact details shown on the screen. Um, thank you Graham and, and Camden for this er very early presentation uh, in your day. Um, and thank you for all attendees to for joining today. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, that's it. We will wrap up the webinar now. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks.